Hey everyone, Weston Nakamura from Real Vision in Tokyo. So, first I want to just sincerely just thank you all for watching, for subscribing, liking, you know, sharing all of our various content. But most of all, thank you for proactively engaging with all of us. Um, and to that end, I have a very simple message for you. We hear you. Okay, so Real Vision is not like a one-way presentation. Uh, this is a conversation starter. And we by which I'm referring to, you know, the broader Real Vision community as a whole. Um, but we all benefit from, you know, your interaction and your engagement uh, via your questions um, and, and responses to a piece of content that we would put out. So what I'm going to do today is to take a question from one of our community members on my recent video I made called The Land of the Rising Yen. This is from August 1st. Um, and I'm going to do a deep dive full response to that question because the question did two critical but fundamentally opposite things simultaneously. Number one, it widened the horizon of the discussion itself. And then number two, it also steered the discussion by zeroing in on, you know, what to do next, where this goes next, right? So. Broadly speaking, this is why this is such an excellent question and why I've ultimately chosen this particular question to use for today's, you know, mailbag and to hopefully encourage more of this type of engagement going forward. OK, so let's get into it. So the video I made uh, was an analysis of basically what's driving the yen price action um, and why every investor across asset classes needs to be watching the yen right now because the yen has very direct cross asset implications. Uh, and the question was just very straightforward. Uh, cross asset ripple effects aside, what's the best way to go about actually trading the yen? And, you know, how to actually take action on actionable content. And so today, I'm putting my trader's hat on, and I will lay out the various ways that one can actually take market action and trade yen exposure through various instruments and strategies and structures that go far beyond just you know a, a forex account trading spot dollar yen and some of these are fairly unconventional so even you know to you pros out there to you seasoned pros you might be pleasantly surprised hopefully pleasantly surprised and as you know my trading disclaimer this is absolutely not trading advice just like the original video isn't trading advice this is just us as a community moving the conversation forward so here's the basic premise of my video on yen price action drivers so the yen, which was the worst performing major currency versus the dollar in the first half of this year, the yen is sharply reversed course and is currently surging, or dollar yen collapsing, pretty much one directionally. It's down about 3.5% in the last three or so trading days ever since July of FOMC. This isn't the dollar weakness story. This is hand over fist yen buying or yen short covering and frantic position closing underway as we speak at the time of this recording, which is Monday, August 1st, after Japan market close, for the sharpest two-day rally in the yen since the tumultuous days of March 2020. And this is currently the longest win streak on consecutive days since February of that year as well. Okay, so why is this happening? And ultimately, why should you care? Shorting the yen has been the Fed trade, if not the global macro trade of 2022. And as such, Shorting the yen or being long dollar yen is thereby an incredibly crowded trade, almost one sided. When the most or one of the most crowded trades in global macro is suddenly reversed in course and people are rushing for the exits, I don't care what the trade is, you need to pay attention to it. What's moving spot dollar yen by and large, um, especially in these like very sharp moves, both to the upside and the downside, it's yen listed derivatives or CME futures and options. Okay, which basically get triggered by fundamental macro catalysts as well as simply by price action momentum. Okay, this is just a simple chart of yen futures on CME and uh, yen futures trading volume on the bottom. And I've also overlaid spot dollar yen in blue shaded area on top for, for reference. From a market price action analysis standpoint, I'm not looking at spot dollar yen because that's not the driver that's being driven by futures and options on yen. Look at the price action, the sharp movements and the corresponding trading volume spikes, both to the upside and the downside that are happening throughout this period. 
So what happens is, because the yen's a Fed trade, or a Fed BOJ policy divergence or convergence trade, or an inflation versus recession trade, anytime you get some sort of major market moving macro data related to any of that, or if certain price levels with a ton of options open interests are breached, then you get huge sudden moves in yen futures, which corresponds to sharp stair-step movements in spot dollar yen. Here's June FOMC, and then here's June BOJ, okay? Yen futures up, and then crash back down. Strong non-far payrolls, which is hawkish Fed, and therefore more yen shorting because there's more policy divergence. And then you get US CPI in the nine handle for even more yen downside. And that was yen at its lowest, or dollar yen at nearly about to break 140 as this policy divergence was just very full-fledged. Then July BOJ and ECB, which were on the same day. And then the short covering began. And the earliest traders took profit on the policy divergence trade. And just as selling begets selling, buying or profit taking begets profit taking. And so we start to see yen bottom out and start to rise. Then July FOMC hits last week. And apparently the markets took a 75 basis point hike and killing forward guidance as less hawkish than expected. And that triggers call options gamma activity or what we saw the way down with the mechanics of how options deal or hedging works, but just in reverse. And the yen jolts higher and dollar yen stair steps down. The day after FOMC, you get US GDP, which put US in technical recession. There's literally a shift from inflation to recession in terms of market mentality. And then the yen surges again. Dollar yen, like round levels, like 130 or whatever, like, yeah, they matter, but not really. Uh, not nearly as much as one would think, okay? And then key dates that I'm watching uh, and or possibly trading ahead of, you, things like US CPI next week or any like US data that could shove markets away from recession and back to inflation focus, temporary or otherwise, or the other way around. Um, and then central bank wise, you know, the RBA, the Bank of England this week, Jackson Hole later this month, things like that for a policy divergence themes to play out. Those are potentially yen directional triggers. Cool. Thanks, Weston. And by the way, nice shirt. Maybe don't wear the same shirt from your generic thumbnail used in all of your previous videos. Uh, it's what we call in the financial media industry laundry day. Now, here's the question from the Real Vision platform from Hirokazu S, who asks... What other instruments other than flat out exchanging yen or buying options contracts can be used? And then he asks YCL, which is the ProShares Ultra Yen ETF. So thanks Hirokazu for this excellent question. And Hirokazu, given your name, I'm assuming you're Japanese um, and you probably go by Hiro for short. Um, and if not, my apologies, but I'm just going to refer to you as Hiro. Now, Hiro is asking about YCL. Um, that's the U.S. listed ProShares 2x levered inverse short yen ETF. And I'll get to the ETFs later, but let me just first go in order of how one can trade uh, the yen in sort of asset class order. So here I want to avoid flat out exchanging yen um, and trading options. And so let's do that first. Okay, I won't talk about options here in this video, only to say that options can indeed be a great way to trade the yen. Um, and there are options on yen futures as well as yen ETFs, and I'll leave it at that for options. Now, the first part, he brings up, you know, flat out exchanging dollars or euros or what have you for yen. This is not really ideal. You know, like this isn't like a Forex kiosk desk at the airport who's quoting dollar yen at like 100 bid, 150 ask or some criminally widespread, right? Um, and that's also not a trade, right, to exchange your cash like USD for JPY or vice versa, right? Because although, yes, being long cash is a position in itself, right? You're never not invested. You know, even if you're in cash, you're still long USD against inflation or against other currency fluctuations or against hard assets, right? But that point aside, if you're talking about converting your cash currency for another, your cash currency, like that's supposed to be your risk off cushion or your dry powder, not your active capital at risk, right? For me personally, as you know, uh, Japanese American, I converted my JPY cash to USD earlier this year. But again, that wasn't a trade. 
That was me fleeing Governor Kuroda, who was about to put the entire country on a you know 20% off sale rack. So, what you can do is you can actually take a direct position in the Forex markets, which requires you to have a Forex trading account. Now, depending on where you live, there are different rules and regulations um, and suitability requirements, as well as different you know options of Forex brokers and their respective trading capabilities but the biggest factor with forex is leverage now i know that some might you know recoil at the thought of using leverage and understandably so as leverage can destroy you and wipe you out but that said margin and leverage uh in and of itself isn't like good or bad it's how it's used or misused that's good or bad um, but active forex trading by nature does require some degree of using margin because you know among the major fx pairs for which the yen is the third largest and most traded currency in the world, say a 1% intraday move up or down, that's a pretty significant move. Be it euro, dollar, dollar yen, sterling, CAD, Aussie, whatever it is, right? But say you do successfully trade that 1% single day move um, in the spot rate. You know, that's a pretty poor return, 1%, for a brilliant trade. And I'm not even talking about, like, you know, after trading fees and spreads that you have to pay for and whatnot, right? So forex trading requires margin for it to, you know, be worth it, right? Another trade with forex accounts is the carry trade, where you know the yen is actually a primary FX leg that's um, used as the funding side, right? So carry trading is basically borrowing or shorting a low yielding currency like the yen, thanks to the BOJ keeping rates on the floor, and then funding a long position in a relatively higher yielding currency to capture that nominal rate differential. As far as leverage is concerned, you know, again, it depends on where you are. Some countries cap individual margin accounts. I, they're probably in the mid single digits, digits if I had to guess. I'm no, not really sure. And some go as high as, you know, over 100x margin, like in, in terms of what they allow. Um, but just to put things in perspective, Japan retail FX trading, for example, which is the world's most fierce and aggressive market impacting retail trading cohort globally by far. Japan re retail margin for Forex is capped at 25x, 25 times, okay? But whatever the margin limit is, you can adjust and use as much or a little margin as you want. And as long as you set your stop losses and you risk manage and, you know, you just follow those sort of basic, you know, practices and good principles, then trading Forex is a very direct, straightforward way to trade currencies. Now, if this is all new to you, then this particular dollar yen play from this video is likely not for you to do via Forex, as I would strongly suggest anyone who's interested in trading Forex to do so with like a demo account first so that you really understand how like the margin balances work. Okay, now let's talk FX listed derivatives or futures and options. Now I know Hero is asking about instruments excluding options, so I won't go into the options part, but let's talk futures. Yen futures exist on various exchanges worldwide, but the primary one being yen futures on the CME in Chicago. This is the very market I'm referring to in the video that's shoving spot dollar yen around. Um, and yen futures on CME, this is the very instrument in which asset managers and hedge funds have, you know, crowded into uh, shorting the yen in record size as the macro bet of 2022, or at least for the first half of 2022. So yen futures on CME, they're pretty large size notional per contract, 12 and a half million yen notional exposure per contract, but there are also mini and micro yen contracts as well, which are a tenth of the size, um, but they're not very liquid or you know heavily traded at all. Um, and then also note that like with the micro yen futures on CME, those are quoted as dollar yen and not as JPY USD. Um, and outside of CME, again, depending on where you where in the world you are, you might have um, futures brokers or online trading platforms that offer their own like proprietary small sized yen futures contracts. Um, futures are, of course, leveraged instruments by nature. Um, and so you need to put initial margin outlay and maintenance margin. But with futures, you know, you have to also be aware of contract expiry and the futures role. It's where investors have to maintain their long position or the short position. So they close the expiring contract and then they open the next front month contract, right? This happens monthly or quarterly. Um, and of course you need to be aware of options open interest on futures as I explained in the video. Um, and this pertains to anyone trading 
VN or FX exposure via any instrument because options on futures have been impacting and driving price action of futures, which there which then drives uh, spot dollar yen. And then also depending on where you are, you might be able to trade CFDs or contract for difference, which is a completely separate uh, instrument. It's a derivative that is very similar to futures contract, but note that CFDs are not allowed in the US, um, but they're very popular in other areas too, Europe, Australia, and other places, okay? Okay, and finally, let's talk ETFs as per Hero's question. So in the US, there's two main types of ET uh, yen ETFs. So the first one, let's go over, um, is what Hero asks about, YCS, okay? That's the ProShares Ultra Short Yen uh, ETF. And basically what that is, is uh, it's an ETF that tries to replicate the daily, you know, double inverse performance of of dollar yen, or basically it's a, you know, a 2x yen ETF since dollar yen quotes the yen inverse as it is. Now, normally I would advise against holding, you know, levered ETFs or inverse ETFs for anything other than very like super short term time horizons uh, because levered ETFs are structured in a way that they, you know, bleed away at the value of your capital if you hold them over long periods of time. Um, you see this typically with commodity ETFs. But YCS actually holds currency swaps with UBS and Goldman, according to their prospectus, um, in order to get this double inverse exposure. But actually, um, YCS has actually held up quite well in tracking 2x the yen year to date. So dollar yen is up about 15% year to date as of this recording, YCS is up about 31%. So it's actually doing a bit better than the double short yen that it's supposed to do. Also note, so YCS assets under management, if you look at that, it looks pretty small. It is pretty small. It's under 100 million, right? But the daily turnover volume is relatively high, which is what would one would expect when it comes to levered ETFs um, that are designed for, you know, one day holding periods. So if you're looking at like, you know, flow data, when it comes to these sorts of um, daily levered ETFs, the fact that you don't see any change in flows for these ETFs, it doesn't really mean anything because people are in and out and they're not really creating or redeeming new ETF shares. So don't look at that key ETF metric that usually applies to other non-levered ETFs. Okay, and then the second one, the main yen ETF listed in the United States is FXY. That's the Invesco Currency Shares Yen ETF. Very straightforward, right? It's not levered, it tracks the yen. It's more liquid, more options activity and open interest and all that. And notably, FXY has an expense ratio of 40 basis points, which is half of the 90 basis points that YCS charges. That said, if you're trying to play yen downside and you're deciding between shorting FXY, which requires borrowing shares and paying a borrow fee accordingly and all that, or just going long YCS, you know, it depends on the time frame, but by and large, just simply going YCS long is probably the better of the two uh, for an overall way to, you know, to do it rather than shorting FXY, if that's the, the direction that you want to play. Now, here are some other alternatives that you can do. If you're just a stock investor and you don't have a Forex account or a futures trading account or a CFD trading account, and you don't want to deal with margin and you also don't want to deal with currency ETFs and expense ratios and fees and tracking error and so on. Here is an interesting way to play yen directionally with near zero capital outlay to put the trade on that I have constructed. So as a former hedge fund sales and you know macro salesperson on the institutional side, you know, I'm always looking at and kind of constructing like long short market neutral pair trades. A long short market neutral pair trade is when you short a stock and then you use the cash proceeds from that short to fund a long position in another stock um, for the same dollar amount. And thereby that makes your out of pocket capital, you know, to put into the trade um, at effectively zero net of trading fees. Okay, so for playing the yen, the trade is as follows. You use the following two ETFs. Number one, DXJ, which is a Japan equity ETF that's currency hedged. And then the other one is EWJ, which is a different Japan equity ETF that's not currency hedged. 
Now, DXJ and EWJ's constituent holdings are not exactly the same, but they're also not too different either. Like, they both hold a few of the same names, like Toyota, MUFG, you know, I think Sony as well, uh, in their top 10 uh, holdings, and their holdings are capped at max 5% per name uh, for both ETFs. Um, but by and large, you know, they, they're just Japan large cap ETFs, and one is currency hedge and one is not. Okay, so see this chart of the performance of DXJ and EWJ year to date. Huge difference in performance, right? Um, and if you think it's because of like the makeup of you know each of these ETFs, this is a chart of the Topics Index, which is a cap weighted broad index of you know Japan equities. That's basically a general reference of how a broad basket of Japan equities have performed year to date. So the massive difference in performance between these two, you know, U.S. listed Japan ETFs is clearly, you know, primarily the currency hedge in DXJ or the lack thereof in EWJ, uh, as per this chart with spot dollar yen overlaid. So what one can do is to go long DXJ currency hedge Japan ETF and short EWJ, the non-currency hedge Japan ETF. And here's what that long short ratio looks like and you can see that uh, going long DXJ and short EWJ that mirrors spot dollar yen in price action percent for percent and even over the, like the long term over years as well because essentially what the long short pair structure is doing is it's negating or it's canceling out the Japan equity parts of the ETFs and leaving only DXJ's currency hedge. And so again, market neutral, right? So you're short one to fund the other, which is very capital efficient, far more so than, you know, cash outlay of paying $50 or $70 per share for currency ETFs, right? So if you're bullish dollar yen, you're long DXJ, short EWJ. If you're bearish dollar yen, you go long EWJ, short DXJ. Final point I'll make regarding all these instruments is trading hours. As we know, FX trades 24-7, okay? That can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your personal circumstances. FX by nature is global and international. So, you know, you may want or need to be able to get in and out at any time of day as world developments occur. And it could also be a bad thing if you're, say, if you're like very highly leveraged in a volatile overnight environment and you wake up to a margin call or forced liquidation, right? Um, currency futures, they're not 24-7 um, trading hours, obviously, but they're fairly close, right? I think they trade all but maybe two hours per day from close to the next day's open. Um, but these proxies and these ETFs, those trade during cash equity hours. So rather than trading 24 hours per day, they trade six and a half hours per day from, you know, market open at 9.30 a.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Um, and again, you might find that to be advantageous as you won't be stopped out overnight um, or not if something happens outside cash, um, cash equity market hours. And on that last point, uh, just note that in times of volatility, which the yen has certainly been susceptible to year to date, but uh, the yen, as I explained in my video, tends to really move during X US hours. So currency markets in general, they have like three general time buckets in the day. There's the Tokyo Asia session, there's the European London, you know, sort of handoff session, and then there's the US open session. Um, and you will get sometimes, you know, the, the most sizable moves during the Asia and London open hours. Um, which then tend to lead to a gap up or down um, at U.S. open for these FX instruments. Here's a chart of dollar yen trading 24-7. Let me just invert this for the purposes of this chart. Um, and then let me overlap FXY, which is that U.S. listed currency ETF. And the overnight stuff going on um, when FXY isn't trading, you know, you're insulated from that. But not really at the next market open if markets don't stabilize back to where they closed. So you do have to keep that in mind as well, regardless of what instrument that you are trading the yen with. Now, obviously, it's not going to be as black and white as that. There's many factors involved, especially with, you know, global instruments like currencies. But by and large, that is how one could go about actually putting into action trading the yen. 
to the upside to the downside whatever it may be whatever it may be these are your instruments that you can use these are things that you need to be um, paying attention to and by no means are either of those comprehensive but this is just my response to an excellent question from hero so thank you hero thanks to all of you keep the good questions coming let's keep the conversation going okay thanks a lot see you next time we hope you enjoyed the video at real vision we help you understand the complex world of finance business and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts join the revolution at realvision.com